Hey everyone, I'm Devin, and I'm here with Jeremy Tracy of Tracy Boards. Jeremy, why why are we here? Why are we why what are, are we, we doing? Here? Why are we here with you doing the intro on my channel? Yeah, why are we here? What am yeah. I what, what am I here for? <laughs> We're all here because we're not all there. Why are you here? Here in Arkansas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm not in Canada. Yeah. So I, I kept having, I kept getting the same feedback from people that I talked to. Like, for example, when I was in Vegas and somebody asked me kind of our origin story of uh, Tracy Boards, how it got started, and some of the background. And uh, I had a few conversations like that. And after we chatted, they were like, man, you've got to share this story. Like, it's so cool. It should be part of your, you know, uh, you know, uh, part of your business, part of your marketing, part of it, like get that story out there. And for me, I felt a little pretentious sitting in my studio by myself and going, my name is Jeremy. And, I, and then I'm like, it would, would you talk like that? If probably, you were by yourself? <laughs> probably not. And uh, then I got thinking, I'm like, it would just, to me, it would feel more comfortable. And more importantly, I feel like it would just be more enjoyable for people to hear the story if it was more of an interview style. Sure. And then, as you said, the other, everybody else I could think of. Was Everyone busy. else said no. <laughs> But no, you and I have known each other for a while. I uh, Almost four I, years now. Yeah, a little bit of you goes a long <laughs> way. Um, but no, I mean, we enjoy each other's company and and I think, I'll speak for both of us and say that. And I was just like, what a cool guy to have interview me. Sure. And so like while I'm here, the goal was to do this interview and also record some Crokinole content for your channel as well as uh, play the game HQ. Well, so, that's right, that's right. Okay, so I have done a little bit of research. And by that, I mean you sent me the most <laughs> labyrinthine Google sheet of different tabs in which you spliced up your life and shared parts of your uh, experience with me. So I have done the due diligence to mine that... Uh, did you talk to Elaine? Like, did you really do your due diligence? Because that would have... I didn't call Elaine because uh, I know how she feels about me. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I didn't want to upset her. Right. <laughs> so, all right. If we're gonna kind of go through, as you said, your history and your experience and your story and the the origin of both what you do as a player and what you do as a professional and as a business owner, uh, I kind of want to start all the way at the beginning, uh, as most people do with a story. Right. Uh, so that's why. I based you. off of your professional. Uh, lineage or career yeah. that you've had. You've toiled on farms, mm. you've built barns, you've done door-to-door -door sales, you've sold real estate, yeah. you've worked in construction, yep. you've delivered furniture, sure have. you've acted as a personal trainer and coach, and you've even owned and operated a kickboxing franchise for quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. So suffice to say you've had a varied work history. Yep. Um, other than the kickboxing franchise, um, you did something that was similar to me mm -hmm. kind of when I was trying to figure out where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do, which was you spent about two years or less at something before moving on. And um, in my perspective, I kind of view myself as restless. Mm. And Amber has always said, she's like, you don't like to be under anyone. You like to be your own boss of what you're doing. And it seems like the two things that you have stuck to the most, like the kickboxing and now the crokinole, yep. that there's a little bit of a parallel there where when you have the control and the creativity to do what you want and kind of spread yourself yep. in as many ways as you want to, mm -hmm. that that's where you've enjoyed that. So I guess, um, is there any parallel between when you took over the kickboxing franchise yep. and in your current state as like the head of Tracy Boards and yep. the current business owner that you are, what are the things about those two types of jobs that really kind of like kept you there? That's a great, that's actually a great question. And the funny thing is when I, I send you that sheet and you're going, oh, there's this theme, like every two years you switch to something different. You, you actually, believe it or not, got the Coles notes. There's a, there's a few other things that, and a lot of those things, like uh, there was a lot of times I was doing two or three things at the same time. Yeah. Like I had a job working in a gym and I was doing the fitness kickboxing and I was speaking, like going out professional speaking, all yeah. those things overlapped and it's mm -hmm. kind of... It's kind of weird for me to look at my resume, if you want to call it that. But uh, as far as the parallels between that and this, like I said, when I started the kickboxing, I had a huge passion for it. I absolutely loved it. Um, 
even when I was personal training, I don't particularly enjoy working out, but I enjoyed that type of a workout. So I say, you know, I look at the first, you know, six, nine, 12 months in that business. If I had sat down and did pen to paper and figured out my hourly wage, a smart man would have quit because it wasn't, it didn't pay me well, but I had such a passion for it. I enjoyed running the classes. I enjoyed the people. And that's what caused me to push through and get it to a place that it was, it was fairly successful for a while. Um, with Croconol, same thing. I have such a passion for this. Uh, it, this started very part-time for me. Mm -hmm. I had to have another job on the side, but I had such a passion for this that I was willing to push through the times when I made no money or not very much money for a little while until it got to a place where it became more successful. And yes, I am, I mean, at this point, I'm straight up unemployable. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what? You're... Oh, I have to show up at this time? No, I don't think that works for me. I yeah. just, yeah, I'm, I'm wired to be... To work for myself. Yeah, and during your previous positions, were you satisfied while you were at those jobs, or were you frustrated? Like, like, did you feel like you were searching something for something and you just hadn't found it yet? Like while you were in those other positions, or was it just kind of like job to job? The, I mean, some of those were just jobs. Some of the jobs I had over time were, were just jobs. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess I, one of the things I've been a victim to is shiny object syndrome. Like I'm going along, this job's going well, but then, ooh, there's this opportunity and I kind of get, I get squirreled. Mm -hmm. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the things that I learned that lesson a, a number of times through my life. There have been shiny objects that have come along since I started Crokinole, since yeah. I started Trophy Boards and this shiny object would come along and I go, nope. No, no, no. I've, <laughs> I've played that game before. I don't like how it ends. Yeah. One of the reasons this business has been as successful as it has is because I have exercised the discipline to not get distracted by those shiny objects. Sure. This next question is a little bit more personal. Um, okay. But it stems from some comments that you shared, and then also it is tied to how I've felt in some of my previous jobs. When were you at your lowest mentally? Like what was the spark that motivated you to change things? Mm. Um, and those are kind of connected, I guess, in yep. how I'm viewing them. So, uh, yeah, that's a deep question. Do I want to be that raw and vulnerable? Sure, let's do it. Um, no, the uh, the truth is, I had I had some business ventures, like uh, probably the one that comes to mind when I was. I had some things that didn't go well. I had some things that didn't go well, and I had some things that went horribly. Uh, when I had a business that I was doing speech coaching and professional speaking, and when that started to go bad, I got in my own head. I jammed up. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, there were opportunities that I didn't have the skills or the know how to take advantage of. And there was all the uncertainty of not having a stable income. I mean, you go and you make a whole bunch of money in one night and then nothing for a while. And when you yeah. are the primary uh, breadwinner of a family of five, that, that pressure is significant. So I went from that to going back to a very manual labor job. So I went from being a professional speaker, standing on stage, getting paid to speak periodically, not very often, but anyway, from that to making a very, very small wage, uh, working, installing equipment in farms. And there, there's nothing wrong with that, but it was, it was very humbling to go from that place and to working, assembling sprinklers or something like that. Yeah. Um, that was not my finest moment that wore on me. So I, I had a couple of jobs like that, but as much as that didn't feel good, the security of knowing that every other Friday I was going to get a paycheck. Oh, okay. I can buy groceries for my family next week and yeah. the week after that was such a relief. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, the, the, when I was working 60, 70 hours a week, not really enjoying my life. There was no drive, there was no goals. I was basically drinking beer after work every single day because just kind of numbing myself out. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, that was, that was a pretty low point. I yeah. think you asked what... What seismic shift was there that pushed you out of that? Mm -hmm. So uh, my wife. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And how did Elaine factor into that? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I mean, she's 
I mean, her and I have been together since I was 18. We've been together a long time. We've been through a lot together. Um, I try to I try to make this succinct, but there was a years before this. What I'm going to talk about now, years before we had gone to uh, an intro session for a personal development program. It was a three day program called Personal Mastery. We went to it. To me, it was it was interesting. We've always studied things like that, uh, books, courses, this and that. To me, it was it was fairly interesting. So on a scale of one to ten, I'll give it a six. Like yeah. I was fairly interested. Elaine was like, "Oh my soul! Like I really want to take that course." And at the time we didn't have any money, so we're like, it became a someday thing. And we put it off and put it off and put it off. Elaine came to me and she said, <clears throat> I just checked into it. That course is being offered about an hour from here, uh, the second weekend next month. I'm making this up a little bit, but you know, about a month though, it is available. And I was expecting her to say, I'd like to go. But what she said was, you should go. And I'm like, what? What do you What do you mean? Like you? Like I was a little bit interested. You were really interested. Why should I go instead of you? And she said, "Okay, I'll say this without swearing." She doesn't swear a lot, but she, I do remember she swore that day. She said, "Something needs to change," and it wasn't like something needs to change or I'm going to leave you. That's not what I mean at all. She was just like, "You aren't happy. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not enjoying watching you not happy." Mm -hmm. something needs to change, you should go. Yeah. So I went to that course, it blew my mind. I mean, I'd done a lot of stuff before, but that one was just absolutely amazing. I immediately signed up for their five day intensive that was down in Colorado. So it was a month or two later, I took that. And it was when I came back from that, that I made the decision to quit my job. Um, yeah, so I quit that job. And it was really cool because I got really, really clear on what I wanted. I wanted a job that nobody needed to train me because I knew I wasn't going to stay. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a job that was part-time because I didn't know what it was, but I wanted room in my head, in my life, and in my heart to have an opportunity of some kind. Sure. No idea what it was. And so I got clear that that's what I was looking for. I don't know what it's gonna be, but that's what I was looking for. I ran into a friend of mine who was working in a furniture store and it come up, he was like, we're looking for a delivery guy. And I'm like, cool, I'm looking for a change. And he said, yeah, we don't even need somebody full time. And I went, perfect. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. So I took a huge pay cut, a huge hourly cut. Like my hours were cut in half. I mm -hmm. went from like 60, 70 hours a week down to 30 hours a week, big pay cut. And Elaine supported me in this because it was like, something's good, I need to free up space. And I think it was like two months later when somebody came to me and said, I think Willard's looking to retire. You should go talk to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy crap. It wasn't like I quit my job going, oh, I wonder if I'll make a board game. Like, yeah, anyway, yeah. It was like when I look back at that, it was so cool the way the serendipity, the whatever you want to call it, the way that worked out, I think is pretty cool. But and I think across the story that you shared, uh, there's a couple different turning points, but I think one of the major early ones would be the first time that you met Willard. Yeah. And so you obviously had um, the context of, of him in your head, but yeah. for those people who don't know who Willard is, yes. could you explain who he is? Yeah, so Willard had been building boards. At that time, Willard had been building boards for 30 years. His dad built them for 20 years before that. Willard was the official board builder of the World Crokinole Championships, and many considered him to be the best crokinole board builder in the world. Mm -hmm. And he lived a three minute drive from my house. I knew who he was, but I had never met him until we got together to talk about the business. Okay. Uh, and when we're talking about business, uh, cause we're gonna take a shift in a moment, but I wanna ask one last question. You attend business seminars now, mm -hmm. uh, similar in some respects to the personal development seminars yeah. that you're talking about. and the personal development one kind of gave you a new headspace yep. to like where you wanted to orient yourself. What do you think it is about these events and the people that go to them that kind of like spur on change for you and Elaine? The difference between who you are now and who you'll be in five years is in the books that you read and the people you spend time with. There's also the thing of um, you are going to become the average of the five people that you spend time around. I really enjoy being around people who have goals, they're driven, they're trying to improve themselves in some way. I love, those are the types of people I like to be around. And did that answer your question? 
I think so. I think yeah. so. It, you were looking to improve your own life, and there are people who I have been around in my experience that have uh, bad circumstances, but they kind of just dwell in it mm. rather than seek to escape it. And yep. it seemed like you wanted to escape, and so being around other people that were looking for self-improvement yeah. is a motivating environment, I think. Yeah, uh, I have huge respect for anyone who's trying to improve in any way. And, and to me, wanting to improve or trying to improve doesn't mean that you're unhappy, that life is bad. I love my business and I still wanna grow it, not because I'm unhappy with it, but because I see potential for more and I love the challenge of growing it. And I mean, I've got a lot of other reasons. There's a lot of reasons why I wanna grow this business, but I think, I think we might touch on that further along here. You were a year and a half when your granddad first introduced Crokinole. Uh, and then you were seven years old when you got your first board. And so I don't assume you don't remember the year and a half part, um, even though it may have been told to you or shared to you by your family members. But I assume that you do remember as a seven-year-old that first board. And I'm kind of curious, uh, what did that mean to seven-year-old Jeremy? Like, was it a significant thing to you or was it just one of your Christmas presents that year? It was pretty significant. My grandfather uh, absolutely loved games. I mean, he played tennis well into his 70s. I remember he was like, he was in his 80s and 90s and we would go there with our kids and he would very uncomfortably, but still get down on the floor to play games with them. <laughs> He's what I want to be when I grow up. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he just, yeah, he just shares his love for games and getting people involved and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, anyway, um, the board that he had was, I mean, it was like, a thin piece of crap. It really was. The the pucks, the buttons, the discs, whatever you want to call them, they were plastic rings. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, I can still remember them getting, they'd flip over and they'd get hooked over a peg. <laughs> and I mean, we thought it was hysterically funny. Yeah. Uh, as a competitor now, I wouldn't find that very funny in, a, in the world championships to have my buttons stuck on a peg. But uh, the board that I got for Christmas was so much nicer than the one he had. So I, th I felt pretty special that like when Grampy comes, I'm going to be able to and because I would go to Grampy's house and play on his board. Now, when he came to visit, he was going to get to play on my board. So that was pretty cool. I don't know how much of that I processed when I was seven or eight. I also, I loved playing. So for me, it was really cool that I was going to be able to play whenever I wanted. Yeah. Um, yeah. We didn't visit my grandparents that often. So mm -hmm. yeah, there was something special I got to do a few times a year. Now I was going to get to play whenever I wanted. Later on, uh, when all three of your sons were born but were quite young, Elaine bought you another board. Uh, and yep. this was not the Willard board that she got later, it was a different one. So as someone who now makes boards professionally, what do you remember about the craftsmanship of that first board? I remember crawling across the floor to pick up the pegs that had been knocked out because they were pieces of plastic that were just kind of wedged into the holes. I honestly, I don't really remember that much about the playing surface. The pegs were so frustrating. <laughs> I'm like, come on boys, come play this fun game. And then pegs, cur curse pegs as I'm crawling across the floor looking for pegs again. Uh, and that's what I remember. And Elaine will still talk about that now. And she was like, she went out and she spent what she thought was good money. Yeah. It was, I can't remember, 125, 175. But I mean, it was a nice wooden board from a legit game store. And she was like, all right, I'm going to give Jeremy this awesome board. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't all that awesome. So it, it was taking something, uh, it was taking something really fun. And when the pegs were flying out, it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't really fun. But then not too many years later, Elaine and your sons all chipped in together and they bought you your first Willard board. Yeah, so now, you know, we're, we're back to Willard again. Yep. And can you give your professional opinion of that board the first time that, you know, you laid your eyes on it? I remember, I mean, at that time she bought the board and, and Elaine had done some research because she was irritated that she thought she bought me something nice and it wasn't. So she did more research and she was like, it, after I had opened the gift, she was like, it was really amazing because this guy who was apparently like the best in the world at this, he, he lives around the corner. Hmm. And she was like, I went over to his house and picked up this board. And I open it up and I'm sitting there looking at it and I'm like, a guy in town? Like in, a guy in Elmira made, like I'm looking at this going, I was 
fascinated. I'm like, how on earth did he do this? I couldn't find the seams. I'm like, this looks like it came out of a machine, not, in my mind, it was perfect. Yeah. And I was, I was fascinated with the fact that that got built in around the corner from us. What is different about the boards that he crafted versus all the other ones that you played with growing up? It was just better. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between a Ferrari and a Corolla? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, two of my sons drive Corollas, so sorry, boys. Um, uh, yeah, there was just it was just night and day. There was no comparison. Like I'm like this thing is gorgeous. And I think that's a good segue talking about not having gone to the tournaments yet because building boards is only one side of your experience in your mm-hmm. life. You're also a professional crokinole player, but that didn't start until later on. And I think that in addition to Willard, the other person that I could name that would have been really influential in the trajectory of where you are now is Roy Campbell. Yep. And uh, how did his passion for the game kind of like inspire you and alter the course of how you approached Crokinole? Right. So uh, I, I, got, I got to take a minute to just describe Roy Campbell. He's, I think he's 10 years older than me, a bit older than that. I don't know. I was playing pickup hockey. I mean, this this story could not possibly be more Canadian. I was playing pickup pick hockey. hockey. Yeah, this is a normal thing. Yeah, so I'm gonna take this one layer further. It was my friend Anton who invited me to play pickup hockey. I'm like, cool, let's go play hockey. So we walked in, and the first night I walked in, there's Roy Campbell getting his equipment on, and he looked at me, and he was like, "Hi, how are you?" And he said it in such a way. I remember thinking, "Do I know this guy?" And I just don't remember him. But no, that's just Roy. That was just how Roy introduced himself to someone new. It reminds me of when Nolan was young, he just walked through life thinking that everyone was his friend. But I, I feel like that's how Roy lives. Like I walked in and, and like he just talked to me like I was a friend and lo and behold, we became friends. And But I played hockey a few times and then one night we're sitting there and it was before or after the game when somebody said, hey Roy, how did your Crokinole tournament go on the weekend? I'm like, <laughs> what? There's Crokinole? a tournament? there's a tournament? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I placed third at Worlds when you, I'm like, Worlds? He goes, yeah, I mean, I've gotten a lot better playing in a club. Club, there's a club? Like, I mean, I would, anyway, <laughs> I hope I sound childish because I was, I am, whatever. And uh, I, re- I remember it again, like it was yesterday. Um, Roy came over to play. Yeah. And uh, by this time I had my Willard board and he was sitting, he was sitting there he shot, this is my button, he shot and he hit it so hard that mine went off and his followed through and landed in the middle. And my chin hit the table and I looked at him and said, did you do that on purpose? And he's like, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a follow through 20. I'm like, teach me. Teach me. <laughs> I, I, that is my favorite shot in the game. That is the shot that made me fall in love with Crokinole. I'm like, okay, I need to do that. Like, I need to learn how to do that. Yeah. Roy and I were we did we were doubles partners for a while. He's he's moved away from Crokinole a little bit now, so him and I don't partner together uh, anymore. But both of our styles, when I started playing, my style was extremely aggressive, and I don't mean I screamed at my opponents. That's not what I mean. Uh, I mean I played way more offensively. The, I mean, defense, what's that? I, I had what no is idea. It, you know? Right? Uh, the best yeah. defense is a good offense. Right, exactly. It's a, it's uh, a well known thing. So, Roy and I were perfect partners in that regard because anybody with defensive strategy would have tried to talk one of us out of the crazy shot we wanted to try, where Roy and I would look at it and go, oh, I want to see how this works out. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, he absolutely, and I mean, the cool thing was that I would go over to Roy's place on a Saturday afternoon at one and at like six o'clock, his wife would be like, boys, I think it's supper time. Jeremy, maybe you should run along home to supper because <laughs> we had just been there playing for hours. And then once the boys get into it, I mean, we've got the three boys, but the oldest and youngest play a lot more, but Roy would come over and the four of us would play doubles. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, I mean, we would just thump them and thump them and thump them and teach them at the same time. Like we'd have some games we just played. We'd have other games where we'd stop and go, hey, consider this, consider that. And now the little burgers can beat me some of the time, more than some of the time. They're very good and I love it and hate it at the same time. So can you tell me about the progression of uh, you pushing into clubs and into tournaments and like where did it start and where has that led to? Uh, it wasn't, I mean, right after Roy and I started playing, I went to the St. Jacob's Crokinole Club. Um, 
that was at a time that I was still working a job that was sucking the life out of me. And going there to that club and being around those people was a breath of fresh air. I remember going to Roy later and going, I didn't even realize how much I needed that, but what an amazing way to spend three hours on a Monday night with positive people that are playing this amazing game. Like, I mean, it just like, yeah. So your love for the game and your search for something in your career kind of eventually aligned, which yeah. brings us back to Willard. Yeah. Uh, so you met Willard in early 2018. Yes. What was your relationship with him, and how did that lead you to where you are now with Tracy Boards? Uh, I mean, before we met to talk about the business, uh, we had never crossed paths. Mm -hmm. I'd never laid eyes on him. He had never laid eyes on me that I know. I mean, maybe we ran into each other at the grocery store and just didn't know it. Um, the the cool thing is that, I mean, the cool thing, I say it's cool because it strokes my ego. Um, it's my understanding that a few people had approached him and met with him, I, and there, there wasn't really anybody that was a good fit. Um, it's my belief, although he's never said this, never said it explicitly, I feel that he was looking for someone who could, who would take on the attention to detail and the care to maintain the quality of the product. And I also believe it was very, very important to him that whoever continued this legacy was going to treat people right. Willard is an awesome, honorable man who always treats people right. And I think it would have been upsetting to him to have someone who was, who didn't share that belief. Um, I also firmly believe, even though he's never said it, I think that some of why he agreed to work with me was because the very first time I went to meet with him, Elaine came with me. It was just because that's how we operate. There was a pretty big opportunity decision to be made and I wanted her there with me to hear about it so that we would make that decision together. I, I can't honestly sit here and say that Elaine has supported every one of my ideas, but she has supported so many of them that I can remember, there's one in particular, I had a business opportunity and I was excited about it and I came home and I told her and she stopped and she said, Jeremy, please, please, just no. <laughs> and I went, the woman who sports me no matter what I want to do is saying no. Maybe I should look at this a little. And she was so right. Oh, my soul. I didn't take, I honored that and I didn't follow up on that opportunity. And I am so glad I did. It would have been a disaster. But uh, anyway, did that, yeah. Yeah. I, so, but I guess um, to, fo to follow that or continue that line of questioning, um, what did he teach you and what elements of that still exist like today? Yeah, uh, I mean, everything that I know about Crokinole, no, not everything, because I've learned a lot by trial and error. But I mean, I was in his shop, he took me under his wing, I'm in his shop, down in his basement shop, helping him build Willard boards. So there was this board at home that had been gifted to me that I thought was perfect. And I am now being trusted to build a Willard board. I felt so much pressure, so much, po it's positive pressure, but I felt so much positive. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, like, I'm gonna be putting the rail on a Willard board? I'm sanding a Willard board? And, uh, but yeah, he introduced me to all the suppliers. Like we would go together to meet suppliers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the first, I think, the some of the first Tracy boards that got built were mostly built in his shop. As I, as I set up my shop, and slowly wean myself up. But even once I was building boards in my shop, <laughs> I would uh, I would have a bottom that didn't turn out quite right, and I'd put it in the back of the car, and I'd drive over, and he'd be sitting on his front step, and I'd walk up and go, "Come on, what what's up? What what happened here?" And he's like, mm, "You tighten that clamp too strong. I told you, don't make it Jeremy tight. Make it Willard tight. Like just snug it up anyway." And there was so many different, just these little slight edge principles. And he'd go, I told you, you got to put a knife in here at this stage in the process. And I'd be like, oh yeah. And i go home and I'd make that little change and that problem would go away. And uh, there, Nolan at one point nicknamed him the wood wizard because <laughs> Nolan went with me. There was a board and I'm like, I don't think this is fixable, but I'm going to go see, see what I can learn from Willard. Maybe we can figure something out. And by the time Willard was done with it, the mistake I had made had vanished it disappeared and one's like 
that man is a wood wizard, right? <laughs> like, um, yeah, and I mean, there's still the odd thing that I will go to, not so much on the board building, but just, uh, you know, trying to find us, like if I run into a supply issue or something, then I go to him and I mean, he's, he knows everybody, because I mean, yeah, he's been around for years, everybody, yeah. Um, I, I still call on him for different challenges and Reed, like I'm down here this week and Reed was talking about a challenge that he was having and uh, I'm like, all right, I'm sending you Willard's number. And I said to him, I'm like, Willard will be tickled. Willard will love for you to come visit for you guys to mm -hmm. solve this. And uh, I haven't talked to him again yet, but I'm very confident that that's how it went. Willard comes down to the shop and he walks in and he, and he looks around and, and uh, I've heard him say it a few times. He says, I never wanted it this big for me. Like for him, him and his brother both built boards and they got it to a level that it, serve their lifestyle. It was the size they wanted it to be. They were as busy as they wanted it to be. He never wanted it to be as busy as we are for him, but he's like, I am so happy for you guys. And he, he genuinely means it. And that's, I've had the thought a couple times early on, I wondered if he would regret it. Like he retired, I took over and I wondered if he would, yeah, just have hard feelings about it. But I've, if he does, he hides it well. I've never ever heard him express any kind of a regret. He's very good at just, this is the right time for this transition, makes the decision and he just does it. I think the lack of regret probably stems from him being pretty discerning at the beginning and not following through with any of the original people that had Could approached be. him and, you know, yeah. kind of waiting and binding his time, so. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think it was about two years after I was up and running and he said to me, you know, I held on to a little bit of my equipment in case, and just as a backup plan, because he basically like, he felt good about his decision with me, but it was just like, I didn't know. Now I'm going to get rid of the last of that stuff. I'm confident that you got it. Yeah. And I'm like, man, you waited two years. <laughs> I thought I proved myself before now, but okay. Um, yeah. It just kind of speaks to his commitment to the, the, the legacy, the quality continuing. Nice. So, so what was the history of your company now at this stage uh, prior to the fateful shut up and sit down <laughs> video that kind of catapulted the game in vis into visibility for yeah. other people, yeah. but how was the company prior to that? Um, yeah, it was very small. I was still delivering furniture and uh, building boards in my basement. I was sanding boards in my carport because I I wouldn't I wouldn't do any heavy sanding in the house, so I was putting the rail on the basement. But then I go out in the carport, um, and yeah, when we're up in Canada, so it's so funny when I think back of this, when when the winter was coming along, and I went out to sand boards in the carport one day. I'm like, this is too cold. It is windy. I don't like this, and it just so happened, uh, serendipity kicked in again because Canadian Tire had car tents on sale. So I went, I call it a car tent. I don't know what other people call it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a tent that you can park a car in. It was a 10 by 20 car tent. And I built that and set it up in the backyard on the patio stones. And I moved the sanding portion of my shop into that carport or into that car tent out of the wind. And I would go out there in the winter. I couldn't leave anything out there. Like I couldn't leave my boards out there. The table saw, I'd put a tarp over it. But I would go out there and the problem was there'd be snow on the top and frost would build up inside. And I'd go out there with my boards and as soon as, I mean, I'm, I generate a lot of heat. I'm out there working, it warms up and then it would rain inside. That's not good. So I would go out into the car tent with a mop and I would mop the ceiling, all the condensation off the ceiling and I'd take my boards back there and I would sand them, finish them, and quick get them back in the house and then take them back, take them to the lacquer shop. And yeah, I did that one winter. The following winter, I think, yeah, I, I don't know at what point the shut up and sit down. I think it would have been the next summer, the shut up and sit down. By the time the next winter rolled around, I'm like, I can't spend that. I can handle the cold, but there's a limit to how many hours I can spend working in a car tent. Yeah. Uh, I went to the lacquer shop. I went to the manager of the lacquer shop and I'm like, you got all this space on the second floor. Can I rent a small footprint? Uh, I can't even remember how many square feet it was, but we just draped plastic up and I moved my car tent shop 
to the second floor of the lacquer shop and that's that's where we would go and uh, and do our sanding. And I was there, I wasn't, I actually wasn't there that long. I was only there a few months and then I had the opportunity to rent the shop where we are now. It's a 1600 square foot shop. And uh, yeah, no more sanding in the basement. So for people who aren't familiar with the channel and aren't familiar with the video, could you explain what the shut up and sit down video is and then after that, detail how it affected your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that because yeah, that video came out on June the 28th at 3 p.m. Uh, 2019. Jeez. You can That's go pretty specific. You can go fact check that. So, but I think the fact that I know that and I'm pretty, I'm just going to believe you. I'm pretty darn confident in it that should be some sort of an indication of the impact that it had on my life. Yeah, that would have been um so sorry, the, the question was, uh, oh, that video, Shut Up and Sit Down is a board game review channel in the UK that I had never heard of before. I'm not real, I'm a crokinole player, I'm not a board gamer. Um, you know me well enough to know that. I, I mean, I'll play the odd game, but I'm not familiar with that. I don't even know that YouTube channel, Devon Talks Tables. <laughs> Tabletop? I it's, it's defunct, no right? one watches it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had no idea who they were. But that video came out and uh, Garrett, who now looks after our social media, just made a post congratulating them because their Crokinole video passed a million views, which is pretty phenomenal. And uh, yeah, I mean, they've got a huge following and it's no wonder why. I sat down and watched the Crokinole video. I loved it because it was an 18 minute video on Crokinole. But even, I mean, they could have been talking about tiddlywinks and I would have loved it. Those guys are so enjoyable. They're a lot of fun. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're pretty awesome. So it's not surprising they have the following they do. But when that video came out, as you said, like it just, that video immediately quadrupled my business. Quadrupled? Yes. Quadrupled, wow. Immediately. And I mean, keep in mind, like we were, uh, I mean, we were a little over a year in at that point. And I say we, it was, it was me, Nolan, our youngest son was helping me. He did some sanding because he was still in school, obviously at that point, because that's going back five or six years. So he was like 15, helping me, uh, just helping me out a bit for some, for some cash. Um, I had just gone to my boss at the furniture store and said, I think if I worked just a little bit less, I, I think I, at that point I was down to 20 hours a week. I'm like, I wanna peel it back to 10. I don't wanna leave you guys high and dry, but I wanna peel it back. And I wanna take those extra hours and, and spend some time marketing because I, I really feel like I might be able to make a real go of it. Like I might be able to make this a business. I might be able to make an actual income here, right? Um, so I just gone to them and said that. And then it was my and Elaine's 20th wedding anniversary. So we packed up and we went to Letchworth State Park to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. And I know that when you're on a trip like that, you should not check your email. You should just be connected with your wife. But as a business owner, I was checking my email and day one, I'm like, there's no orders, crap. Day two, no orders, crap. Day three, no orders. Did I make a bad decision peeling my hours back? This is June. Was it a stupid time of year for me to do that? And all this self doubt is kicking in. Like, am I getting ahead of myself? And blah, 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 blah. We're driving home from Letchworth. We stopped at the mall in Buffalo and I open up my phone to look at my email and I turn to Elaine and I'm like, there's been three orders in the past hour. That's weird. She goes, Jeremy, you know that there's little, I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's been dead quiet. And all of a sudden, three orders in the last hour. She's like, yeah, whatever. So she's nicer than that. Anyway, she was like, <laughs> she's like, I'm sure it's just coincidence. So we went uh, wandering around for like another hour. And then we sat down to have supper. And by this time, we sit down and I open up my phone again. I'm like, there's been four more orders in the past hour. That's seven orders in two hours. Something's going on. I don't know what's up, but I like it. Eat up. We need to get home, right? <laughs> So I get home at like 10 or 11 that night and that's when I discover that this video had come out. We got more orders in like three or four days than we used to get in a month and a half. So at the time, I mean, I was making a few boards, like I was just making boards and batches of 10. I always had some that were either ready or close to ready. So somebody would place an order, I'd print the order off, I'd tape it on the wall in my shop. No. And sometime in the next day or two, I'd finish building it, I'd get it packaged up and I'd ship it. That was the process, worked beautifully. When you get 40 orders, 
in two or three days? <laughs> then someone would email and they'd ask me a perfectly reasonable question. They'd say, Jeremy, when do you think my board's gonna ship? And I'd go down and I would look at the wall and I would try to find their order. It was a disaster. It was a it was a administrative disaster. Yeah. And I think Elaine probably heard me cursing and she came down the stairs and she looked and she was like, Jeremy, what on earth is this? I'm like, well, these are my orders, right? <laughs> You need my help. I'm like, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> that is why Elaine, she never intended to be any part of Tracy Boards. That was not, it wasn't on her radar. Oh yeah, Jeremy, you have your project, you have your business, you do your thing. But out of sheer need and pity for her husband, she jumped in and uh, she's never gotten out. We just, much like our marriage, I just kind of sunk my claws in and she hasn't been able to get away. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's probably, I couldn't ask for a better transition because I wanted to talk about your family because I think that your story isn't really complete without kind of examining the influence and the involvement of both Elaine and then now your, your three sons. Mm -hmm. So you got together with Elaine in 96 and it seems like, you know, she's both supported and pushed you at kind of the right stages all along this process. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, how do your sons fit into the picture? Uh, yeah, so three boys, they are now 25, 23, 21. Nolan, the youngest, he was the first one to come on board working. And um, we get into the shop, so it was Elaine, myself, and Nolan. The business was growing to the point that I, it was like, okay, we need another person. The, Nolan and I cannot keep up with the demand. We need another person. and get a little bit deep here, but there is something that I would call a mind virus. And that, like, limited thinking. When people have a, a limited belief and something that I hear business owners or bosses or managers say, there's no good workers out there. There's no good workers out there. And they say that, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and then they wonder why they can't find good workers. I refuse to buy into that mind virus. But at the same time I was saying, I do believe there's good workers out there. I believe there's a lot of great people out there. There's people that have good workers. I also recognize that I don't have any experience or the skill set of how to find them, how to hire them, how to train them, how to manage them, how to keep them. This is new to me. Like I've had a lot of businesses, but I was always a solopreneur. I never really, I'd never had employees. So I'm like, crap, I gotta find somebody. I've got so much to do. I'm working insane hours already. How am I supposed to find the time to learn the skill and then hire them, blah, da, 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 da. Reed, well, at the time, our oldest son, was working, he was apprenticing for a bricklayer. Mm -hmm. And he just, for whatever reason, he got to a point, he was like, that's not what I wanna do with my life. And I actually, I don't know why this was important to me, but I appreciated the way it worked out. He quit his job and then came home and sat down and said, Dad, I quit. Any chance you've got work for me? I don't know why that felt better to me then I think it's because he quit because he wanted to quit. Like he knew that wasn't like he severed that, like he burned that bridge or whatever. He didn't burn a bridge, he, him and his old boss. He made that decision without any influence from you. Yes, yeah. and I don't know why. It just, it felt better for me to have it go that way. And he said that and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because I knew I had to train him in the craft, but I knew the work ethic was there. And I knew that the pride in his work was there. The biggest problem I had with him when he started was he was such a ramrod because he was a bricklaying laborer who worked like a mule and it was faster, harder, fa like that was their entire mentality. So I would have to go, you've dinged the rail of four boards this week. Can you please slow down, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I mean, it, he he adjusted very quickly, but that was the thing. Like he would be he would be trying to move too quick in the shop yeah. and moving stuff around. It's like you just take twenty percent off there, bud, yeah. right? <laughs> and just and uh, yeah. So he he now manages the shop. He looks after the production side of things. Nice. So yeah, um, Nolan. Like I say, he started with us the first. Uh, he was the first of the boys to start with us. And then it was a couple of years ago, and it was really cool. It wasn't really cool. It made me feel smart. I felt it coming. Mm -hmm. There there was four of us. There was Elaine, myself, Reed, Nolan, all working together, all living together. The world was on lockdown. 
it's amazing we still speak to each other. But the tension just built. And I could feel Nolan's discontentment building and building and building. He comes to me in my office one night and he goes, Dad, I wanna, I wanna talk to you. Can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, sure. And as he walked around the table to sit down, I'm like, you look nervous. And he said, I am. And I said, don't be. I already know what you're going to say. And he's like, I need to quit. I'm like, I know. I just, I could feel it coming. And he's like, I'm 19. I'm living in my parents' house. I'm living, I'm working, working for you guys. I just want to grow up and be a man. And I'm like, good for you. As your dad, I'm excited for you. As your boss, I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> and, but I mean, something I've been, something I actually have a lot of pride in is that I've been very, very careful. And I said, I hope I say it to the boys often enough. As much as I love Tracy boards, as much as I love this business, the trajectory, our goals, everything about it, there's not, it's nowhere near as important to me as my relationship with my sons. So it's like, if we ever get to the place that this business is causing damage to our relationships, then we need to we need to figure that. Like, I'll fire you before I'll have it ruin our relationship. Yeah. So uh, he left for a, a year, and uh, and then eventually, again, he quit the job. He went. He was doing HVAC work. wasn't right fit for him. He quit because he knew it wasn't right, but he hadn't decided what he was going to do. And then when I went to him, I'm like, "Dude, we want you back." Like, there were some things we that both of us weren't doing right before. We need to improve on that would you consider coming back? And he's like, you know what? I've been thinking about it. And fortunately he came back in a different role. He now runs the office and like he looks after all customer emails, the shipping, all that. I think he does an amazing job. And I have customers come to me after interacting with him and like uh, a friend of mine who Nolan didn't know he was my friend, uh, dealt with him for something he needed anyway. And then the guy sent me a, a Facebook message and he was like, dude, I dealt with Nolan, that kid's He's doing an awesome, and I shouldn't Great. say, he didn't say kid, so I shouldn't say, he's not a kid, he's a, he's a young man. Um, yeah, I... But Nolan runs the office, yep. Reed runs the shop, yes. and then what does Garrett do? Garrett's in university, so it was uh, it was about a year ago that he took over our social media. Okay. Uh, we had somebody before that, and a uh, lovely lady, I really liked her, she did a good job. She didn't know the game well enough, and she didn't know. I shouldn't even say that. She didn't know the game or my voice as well as Nolan does. Weird how somebody I didn't know didn't know me as well as my son does. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, Garrett's doing a great job. I, uh, and it's his. I don't think Garrett will ever work in the shop. I don't think that's his strength. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, I wouldn't want any of my sons filling any role other than the one that they're in. Ra I wouldn't want any of them to trade places. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're like, doing what, what suits them. Yes. Yes. So with your sons, with your wife, with yourself, and then the company as a whole, like you mentioned, uh, you know, the trajectory of the business yep. earlier. What do you think that is for the next five to ten years? Like where do you want to take Tracy Boards beyond where it is? Um. My goal when I started this of how many boards we would make a year, we're probably, we're on pace to do about six times that number this year. So what does, if you had told me five years ago, this is where I would be, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. But I, I, so it's really hard for me to wrap my head around the goal for five years from now. Uh, I said earlier that I have a lot of goals and drive when I tell the story of when I first went to St. Jacob's and how much that meant to me to be in a positive environment, that is, those are my favorite emails to get from people or testimonials or just the things to hear from people is the way that they connect in a positive way with their family, with their friends, with their community. I love that. I absolutely love it. A big part of what I do in the business now is that I'm going to conventions. I'm coming down here and ha like, this is work. Hanging out with you, Devin, is work. But no, I mean, I wouldn't consider it fun, right? you know, if you we're had to We're making the best me. of it. I mean, we're, oh, I mean, it's fun for me. I just assume it's not for anyone else. So. No, but I mean, going to conventions and expanding the awareness of this great game, as well as working with, uh, working with people that want to run tournaments or run clubs and helping them do that more easily because I've had a lot of experience with both of those things and I'm just there as a support. We have a program that helps new clubs that want to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, but that's how, that's my work now is building the community. And I'd like to go down as the company and the family who's done more, it's not a competition, but fine. I, 
I take pride in the fact. You're an ambassador for the game. Yes, and yeah, yeah um, I, I want to do even more of that. The other thing that I want is that I want to build the, one of the main main reasons that I want to build the business beyond beyond the community and just the, the pride of all that is that I want the business to be a fantastic opportunity for my boys to grow into bigger roles within the business. I sure. mean, they already have. I mean, Reed is basically doing a lot of what I used to do. He's dealing with the suppliers. He's dealing with, uh, he's got two full-time workers working underneath him. I mean, that's a challenge, but he is needing, it's forcing him in a good way, forcing him to grow as a leader and as a man I think it goes back to what you were saying about your time with Willard. It's positive pressure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's really cool that my main employees, their name is literally on the product that we build. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It, I'm there. I take a lot of pride in it, and it's a lot of positive pressure on me to be a positive role model for them, a mentor for them. Um, but I love having them working for me and holding me accountable. One of the, like you mentioned the business program we're a part of, one of the things that our business coach gets us to do is once a quarter we do a, a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And it was the last one we were doing, it was so funny because I one of the things I listed as a strength was the fact that our key team, like our key team members, Reed, Nolan, and Garrett, they they their name is on the product. They have so much pride and vested interest in the growth of this business, in our reputation, all that. That's awesome. That is a strength. Yeah. Um, a weakness in our business is the fact that my key employees are my sons. Because when I tell them as their boss to do something, there are times that I feel like they push back to me in a way that I wouldn't put up with from anybody else. And in a way that they would never, it's pushback they would never give to any other boss. But it's its just, it's a different dynamic because yeah. it's father and son. And at the same time, there are times that they will challenge me in a way that no other employee would have the guts to do. Mm -hmm. And there's been times I've been super grateful for that. Um, yeah, there's been times that Reed has stopped me uh, and they went, whoa, you need to take a breath. Maybe you should deal with this problem on Monday because if you try to go deal with it today, you may say something that you don't feel amazing about afterward. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think either of our other employees would ever have the guts to say that to me when I was fired. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So looking back on all of the things that we've chatted about and the story as a whole, uh, what do you think are some of the best lessons you've learned along the way? Mm. I would say there, there, there's three things that immediately come to mind when you say that. Um, you know, it's, it's very cliche to everything that's happened in my life prepared me for this, but it's kind of true. I mean, it's cliche, but it's true. So you mentioned the fitness kickboxing. I ran fitness kickboxing uh, franchise for five and a half years. And the skill that that helped harness was the ability to adjust on the fly. Somebody walks into class late, okay. And I feel, I always felt a very positive pressure to keep everyone moving. For me to run a class and people are standing there waiting, it, it just, it made my skin crawl. That's not what they're here for. They pay good money. They want, yeah, they're there to have structure. That skill, like people would, you know, somebody would feel faint and they'd step out. Okay, I had to adjust on the fly. How do I make this work? That serves me very well when I walk into a PAX Unplugged and I run a doubles tournament with 128 people. That ability to adjust on the fly and figure things out and keep things moving, that skill has been amazingly beneficial in running clubs, in running tournaments, in anything like that. It just like, um, Nolan asked me a while ago, he was like, he basically, it was a huge compliment. He basically like, I watch you talk with people in a sales situation. How do I, how do I get as good at it as you are? And I'm like, I don't know, dude, like go door knock selling satellite systems for a year. Like get the reps in. I, I don't. Yeah. And the same thing with the, I mean, there's that. There's the uh, working as a speaker and a speaking coach for as long as I did. Um, I can I can craft a message for a video quicker and easier because of that experience. Um, another, I said three, so that's two. A third one, um, I, when I was working as a speaking coach, I had amazing opportunities that I didn't have the skill. 
I was supposed to put a proposal in for this amazing opportunity. I didn't know what I was doing. I sent in the proposal and they basically come back to me and said, what on earth is this? This doesn't even make sense. And because I was so far out of my depth that I froze up and I wasn't able to capitalize on that opportunity. I remember the first time I sent a pallet of boards internationally and it was a Friday afternoon when the shipping company called me and they were like, where's your B-13? And I said, what's a B-13? And they're like, it's a form you need to fill out for this pallet to leave the country. And I'm like, never heard of it before. I was, I was out of my depth. Yeah. And it was so funny because I remember I got off the phone, I did some searching. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I panicked and I did what I've done in the past and I went back to do my manual work. I went to put some rails on some boards because I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And the old me, I don't know when I would have got that paperwork figured out. You know what I mean? But I went out there and I banded a board and while I was banding, I'm like, crap, I've been here before. I can't make this mistake again. I had amazing opportunities in that business that I screwed up because I was too scared to admit that I didn't know what I was doing and ask for help. I'm not doing, I can't do that again. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the whole, the shiny object syndrome that I used to, a big part of why this has done as well as it has is because I haven't allowed shiny object syndrome to get me. Yeah. So. Anyway. Cool. Well, no, I mean, I appreciate it. I think, you know, you've told me this story in spurts over the course of the last few years, but it is interesting to kind of see it all woven together in one mm -hmm. uh, fell swoop. So I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate you asking. I, I hope anybody's still watching at this point, obviously they got something out of it. Well, I mean, you know, this whole back half is going to be edited off, you know. The we're whole just, back the half? The whole back half. I mean, we're going to, I don't even know, I, no one's watching right now. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be the, the outro, so people are going to watch, but okay. no one's watching right now. <laughs> Well, like one of the one of the shiny objects that I that still pulls at me once in a while. I love. I would love to like podcasts when people are talking about business and success and the difference between something going well and not. I love that. I would love to do. I would love to be the interviewer. I'd love to be the guest on more podcasts. Things like you this. want to be both. Not it does kind of go back to that narcissistic thing that you're yep. talking about. You, know? yeah, you, little... you want to be both the interviewer and the guest. <laughs> no, um, I, I could enjoy I could enjoy both, both roles, at different yeah, times yeah, at yeah. different That's times, fair. and um, yeah, they I I would love to build my business and develop it in such a way that it can still be very with the boys filling bigger shoes and free up the space that I could. I could indulge the shiny object syndrome without Tracy Boards, the business, suffering from it. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, like that that would be a goal over the next five years that, yes, I, I don't see myself retiring. I want to be involved um, and I want to help the boys grow into these roles. One, because I love watching them grow and two, because it could allow me to indulge in some of the shiny object. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah. All right, well, I appreciate you all for listening. Thanks so much for hearing the story of Jeremy Tracy and Tracy Boards. Uh, knee Willard Boards, but now, you know, switched over under your name. And now I like the concept that you said at the end, and I do think it's a beautiful thing to kind of end on, is that with your wife and with your sons, every single person that is kind of like one of the main players at your company has some skin in the game yep. in the sense that their name is on every single product that goes out the door. And so I kind of love the evolution of where you were and all that you have come to now. So mm. that's really awesome. If you guys are unfamiliar with Jeremy Tracy, go ahead and check out Tracy Boards. They are, in my opinion, the best boards in the business, which I think Willard would be proud at who he passed things off to. Yeah, I uh, yeah, and thank you for doing this, man. I, I've enjoyed hanging out in during this time, but also my entire visit. And if you're not familiar with Devon Talks Table Talk or play the game HQ, play the game HQ. The, the thank you for thank are, you for hosting us in. and uh, letting a couple of narcissists sit here and talk about. <laughs> we do a good job of that. Yeah, we do a good job. So yeah, no, thank you. It's been uh, always a pleasure chatting, and hopefully this is uh, this is enjoyable, and uh, hopefully you'll still be my friend. Going forward. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, that was a silly thing to say, but... Go play some Crokinole. <laughs> make, make it a great day. <laughs>